Well, thanks for tuning in to the Sydney Institute's uh, final virtual meeting in this year of pandemic. Um, and thanks to our members who have sent in questions. And today we're finishing the year with Joel Fitzgibbon, who's very well known in Maxie's third appearance at the Sydney Institute. And of course, these days, the member for Hunter. But as uh, those of us know well, he held ministerial positions in the two governments led by Kevin Rudd. Now, Joel's going to speak for us tonight on the right path to victory. Joel Gibbon, Fitzgibbon, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jared. It's uh, great to be back at the Sydney Institute. Uh, it's been 14 months since I was last here. Uh, back then, we could not have imagined uh, the challenges which lay ahead of us, bushfires, a pandemic, and of course, the, the deepest recession uh, in our lifetimes. In that pre-emergency media environment, my October 2019 speech attracted more than a small amount of publicity, and I hope Jared thought that was a good thing. Uh, the media did not focus on the eight lessons I suggested the Labor Party need learn uh, as a result of the 2019 uh, election loss. Nor did it cover my analysis of and criticisms of Scott Morrison. Nor was there any coverage of my warning that the increasingly inward looking posture of many countries around the world, and indeed Scott Morrison's Trump-like dalliance uh, with the notion of a departure from the settled global order were a threat to our economy and a threat to our security. But none of the narrow casting of my speech surprised me, uh, nor, I have to admit, did it disappoint me. What was a little surprising was the political left's disproportionately critical response of my speech a reaction I would best describe as shrill, ideological, elitist, out of touch, and irrational. But let me remind you what they were responding to. This is word for word what I said of the government's climate change positioning here in October last year. I quote, The Prime Minister has largely avoided scrutiny and accountability on this subject because all the focus has been on Labor's more ambitious targets. But what would be the outcome if Labor offered a political and policy settlement to make 28% the target by 2030? The focus would then be all about actual outcomes and the government would finally be held to account and forced to act. A political settlement would also restore investment confidence and for the first time in six years, we could have some downward pressure on energy prices. Based on recent history, 28% would be a meaningful achievement, certainly a better outcome than the one Labor's last climate policy is now achieving. That is lesson six. You can't achieve much if you are perpetually in opposition. As Gough Whitlam once said, the impotent are pure. pure. Close quote. Many of the attacks on me after that speech uh, in response to the question I posed were quite personal, but I don't mind. You'd swear I'd asked not a rational question, but rather advocated for the return of the steam engine, or worse, an increase in the tax on Chardonnay. Now, all of these things only made me more certain that I was on the right track. I feel well placed tonight to claim that I was right about Labor's position or where it should be, that I was right to argue that we should simply back Scott Morrison's target. The public debate, if we had for the last 14 months, should have been entirely focused on Scott Morrison's target and his failure to meet it, but it hasn't been, sadly. In any case, Subject to the timing of the next election, the Morrison government will be required to submit a new medium-term target next year. It makes you wonder what all the fuss about 26 to 28 per cent was all about. Tonight I build on the thoughts I shared with you last year. 
I consider medium term targets to be of limited utility. Medium term targets are a bit like weight loss goals, useful but not mandatory. They provide no guarantee of success, as sadly most of us know. Certainly medium term targets should not be set by opposition parties. From the opposition benches, politicians simply don't have the information available and the guidance they need from the department and the relevant government agencies to determine what rate of achievement is possible without doing harm to the Australian economy and of course therefore Australian jobs. But the Paris Agreement signed by Malcolm Turnbull does require Australia to set a medium term target for each commitment period. Therefore the government of the day must and it must do so on that advice and guidance from the department and the relevant government agencies. But it should not be a commitment made on, it should be a commitment made on behalf of the Australian government and the Australian people, not one made on behalf of any one political party. Once made, Australia's target should remain our target for the whole of the commitment period, regardless of whether there has been a change of government. That means that on winning government, a successful political party should not change the medium term target prior to the end of the commitment period. Providing continuity would take all the political heat out of the target setting and would of course provide investors with the certainty they need to create jobs. While it would be difficult to legislate for a guaranteed continuity, it would be hard for either of the major political parties to reject such a sensible political sentiment and ultimately to accept it as a sen sensible and common sense convention uh, of the parliament. It is of course possible that a government elected early in a commitment period could find itself back in or on the opposition benches uh, before the end of that period. To that prospect, I say tough luck. A new government renewing the medium term target at the end of our commitment period would be expected to follow the same expert departmental and agency advice followed by the previous government. Throughout the COVID-19 threat, a bipartisan view emerged about the need to stick like glue to the expert health advice. If climate change is the existential threat that many argue, why would we not take the same approach to greenhouse gas reduction policies? It makes sense. For the convention to enjoy the confidence of the electorate, more transparency would be required in the delivery of advice and indeed the processes for determining the medium term goal. Ideally, a wartime, wartime like cabinet uh, would, be, uh, would be sensible. Uh, and of course we would have both the major political parties in the room when a target has been considered and eventually embraced. Our medium term target should not be the subject of a political bidding war in which those involved put their own political positions, ambitions, ahead of the national interest. The target of course would become a flaw, a minimum. If a government chooses to go higher, that's a, member, a matter for its leadership. But, but it would also be a matter for its leadership to explain to the Australian people uh, why it is digressing from the expert advice the government had relied, uh, relied upon in setting the target uh, in the first place. It's time to end the climate wars and the damage they are doing to our international standing, as we've seen very recently, the damage being done to our economy and indeed the damage being done to our natural environment. I heard Labor's climate change spokesman Mark Butler claim last week that on Scott Morrison's current policy trajectory, Australia would achieve net zero emissions in 146 years time. Not 140 years, yeah. not 145 years, but exactly 146 years. Now for the punters, this claim is no more believable than Scott Morrison's claim he's on track to meet and beat 
his current medium term target. And it's no more believable than anything the Greens have to say on the issue, or for that matter, those in the National Party. This is the problem with the climate change debate. Politicians are not being honest with the Australian people. That's because honesty would come at the cost of perceived political advantage. For each of the main combatants in politics, meaningful, meaningfully responding to the adverse impacts of a changing climate runs second to political opportunity. Where would the Greens be if climate change was not front and centre of the debate? What would their narrative be? How would they raise funds if they couldn't talk about the threat of climate change? Scott Morrison certainly doesn't want to stop the climate wars because they've substantially assisted the coalition in winning the last three elections. For that reason alone, Labor should commit to whatever medium term target Scott Morrison commits the Australian people to. We should also recommit to net zero emissions by 2050 and commit a Labor government to accelerating the pace of the innovation needed to achieve the mid-century goal. Investing in research, development and innovation and encouraging commercialisation is a very Labor thing to do and Labor governments in the past have proven pretty good at doing it. It takes more effort and thinking than does the implementation of a carbon tax. But the technology path will deliver greater benefits to both the economy and to the environment. It offers more reward and better political outcomes in the long run. It also offers greater certainty and security for working families. Carbon constraints are a 20th, 20th, century, 20th century solution to a 21st century problem. Carbon taxes, or carbon constraints, to use the less scary term, may have been the right public policy back in 2001 and for the decade after. But investors long ago gave up on waiting for the warring politicians to make a decision. They've moved on without us. They've seen us diddle for too long and they've seen us in retreat as we were in 2013 when Tony Abbott repealed Julia Gillard's climate uh, architecture. Over the course of the last decade, large-scale solar and wind farms have become a feature on our regional landscapes everywhere. Australians have taken to rooftop solar like ducks to water. Amazing. More and more motorists are buying electric or high, uh, hybrid cars, and the latest anti-pollution systems on our heavy vehicles are, are reducing their emissions every year, both on-road and, and off-road. Our farmers have been reducing their carbon footprint by embracing the latest and the best production methods, as have our oil and gas producers, our, our miners, and, and our manufacturers. Now, last week, the department released the latest national greenhouse inventory results. They tell us that in the year to June 2020, the emissions intensity of the Australian economy was at its lowest level in 30 years. Indeed, 64.7% lower than it was in 1990. It also, also told us that per capita emissions are down 44.7% over the same period. That's almost half. This is another area where the politicians are misleading the Australian community. We could, of course, do better on climate change, and we should. I earnestly believe that. But Australia is not performing so inadequately to justify the obsessive madness some bring to the climate change debate. Australians care about our natural environment. They know how important it is to both our economy and to our national security. But their top priorities are their own financial security and a safe environment for both them and their families. This has been, never been so true in the post-COVID environment, if I dare call it that. Their priorities, the priorities of working families, should be Labor's priorities. 
18 months on from Labor's 2019 election loss, the Curtin Research Centre's Nick Dorenferb and the AWU's Misha Zielinski have put to paper their views on the future directions of the Labor Party. They invited several Labor parliamentarians and other respected party members to do the same. Each of them was drawn from the party's right faction. All of them made very valuable contributions. Many, in their own way, spoke of the lead role the party's right has played in policy direction and electoral success over the decades. Not one defended the status quo. Senator Mario Smith wrote about the importance of families and the need to ensure they are left in no doubt that Labor stands with them and their aspirations. Michael Eason wrote about the drift of people of faith and the need to once again embrace them and to reassure them, people of all faiths, that their right to adhere to and be guided by their religious convictions is supported and respected by the Australian Labor Party. Shoppies Union boss Jared Dwyer rightly argued that trade unions remain an important part of our social fabric and that collective action remains an important tool in achieving and maintaining some of Labor's key objectives, including equality of opportunity, the right to a fair day's pay for a fair day's work and the right to return home from the workplace every day safely. Speaking on behalf of, North, of, of Northern Australia, and I would like to thank all of regional Australia, Townsville Mayor Jenny Hill sent my admiration for her even higher with a passionate appeal for more than the usual lip service from governments on regional development and regional opportunity and disadvantage. I make passing reference here to the important contribution of Senator Rafficoni, who wrote about immigration, but importantly, uh, the critical nature of regional dispersal. But while the competition was tough, very tough, the essay which grabbed me most was that of my friend, Senator Anthony Chisholm. Chris, Chis provides a frank and depressing overview of the Federal Parliamentary Labor Party's result in Queensland at the 2019 election. And he reminds us that we cannot win government without winning the requisite number of seats in the regional parts of the Sunshine State. Most important maybe of all, Anthony Chisholm reminds us that you can only give effect to good policy from the government benches. Of the opportunity to do good things for Queensland and for Queenslanders, he said, and I quote, to do it, we need to win elections. And that means taking people with us. Winning federal elections isn't easy. Uh, Labor members know this only too well. Only having won a majority of seats in the House of Representatives just once in the last 27 years. I'll repeat that. The Labor Party has won a majority of House in the House, seats of the House of Representatives just once in the last 27 years. Now, it's my view that Labor is not the natural party of government at the federal level. We are in some states, obviously. Interestingly, I could argue in Queensland, where we barely got above 26% of the primary vote uh, at the last election. We're not the natural party. The reality is that they only come to us when they're tired of the other mob and we don't look too scary. And at the last election, for some reason, we seemed to go out of our way to make ourselves look as scary as we could possibly be. We need to read and learn from the various contribution of Nick Durenferth's right stuff. Labor can progress an agenda of positive progressive change consistent with our values while also reassuring the electorate that will put personal safety, the health of the economy and their financial security first. We must leave voters in no doubt that we believe in rewarding hard work and in backing their aspirations, just as much as we believe in making sure no one is left behind.
that is fundamentally a Labor thing to do. And we must be louder and prouder in our support for those who don the high vis each day. Those who earn the export income that earns us in turn the foreign exchange we need to pay for those many imports we've become so fond of. I said in my speech here last year, and I quote, I can't quite pinpoint exactly when it happened, but somewhere along the way, we stopped talking to our blue collar base, close quote. Astute judges of political attitudes who worked the Queen BM polling booth six months ago, went home in no doubt that support amongst our traditional base is yet to be restored. There they encountered voters in high-vis clothing and steel cap boots, turning up with LNP and Shitters and Fishers votes, powder votes, already in hand. In his forward to the right stuff, former Labor Senator Stephen Lucy stated the obvious when he wrote, and I quote, to fail to recognise the significance of regional and rural Australia, especially in the outlying states of Queensland, Tasmania and Western Australia, is to languish in opposition in perpetuity. Close quote. In demographic terms, Queen Beanne is the equivalent of parts of Western Sydney, the Hunter and Central Queensland. We should be very concerned. We won't, won't win back our traditional base from the Senate or House of Representatives dispatch boxes. Our most senior MPs and senators need to get on their bikes. They must visit our coal mines, our gas projects, our manufacturing plants, our abattoirs, our maintenance sheds and the like to tell the workforce that they should be proud of what they do because we are certainly proud of them and what they do. We have a lot of work to do before we can claim that we put the Labor back into the Labor Party. Thanks everyone. So many thanks to Joel Fitzgibbon for a, a lively address and now we come to questions and discussion and uh, thanks to those who are sending questions and uh, on we go, thank you. Well Joel Fitzgibbon, thanks for that and it was a very good follow up to what you said here about 14 months ago which turned out to be quite prophetic although at the time some of your colleagues thought it was quite pathetic. <laughs> but just to summarise the topic of your talk today, the right path to victory. So what's the, to summarise, what's the right path for Labor to get to victory? Well, of course, when I use the word right, I was talking about the, the right wing of the Labor Party, which I think if you have a look at historically, uh, has been uh, a force for good within the party and a force uh, for success. Uh, what's happened to the Labor Party now, for right or from, for wrong, depending on your perspective, is that while the, the right wing still dominates the caucus by a fairly comfortable margin, uh, there are many right wingers that now represent quite progressive electorates uh, who therefore are is necessary, I suppose, to creep uh, further to the left. Uh, and I therefore would say it's probably more accurate to say the caucus is not dominated by the left or the right, but by the progressives. In other words, there are enough progressives in the right who, when combined with the left, uh, control the caucus. Not on every issue, obviously, but I think as a, as a culture, as a cultural force, I think the progressives are, are on the march. Add to that, of course, the fact that New South Wales is the only party branch still controlled by the right wing party. And uh, that's somewhat problematic, not necessarily absolutely problematic because Anastasia cleverly just had a good win uh, in Queensland. Now, Mark McGowan is, is no lefty and had a, you know, I think he's very strong there. So it's not necessarily an absolute problem, but I think it poses challenges for the party. But I also think that, as a, I suppose, a consequence of that, the party has drifted uh, back to the left and away from its traditional base and Labor parties at the federal level, don't win government very often. Uh, I made that point in my address. In fact, we've only won government from opposition three times since the second 
world war, and we only won we, when we build broad coalitions. Uh, so we certainly can't win an election uh, with a collection of progressives, um, whether they be in, in the city, Sydney, or Melbourne, or indeed uh, on the New South Wales North Caps. Uh, we, need to, we can only win if we also have the support of our traditional base, and they have deserved us in large number. And I would suggest to you that in um, not in significant uh, part, um, they have not only left us, they hate us. They feel that we've deserted them, betrayed them. Uh, they think we're in bed with the Greens, uh, and it's going to be hard to get them back, as was demonstrated on, on those Queen Bee Ambers just six months ago. But when you talk about the right path to victory is essentially as as the former convener of the national right, what you're saying is the Labour right's got to become more influential within the caucus. But you're also saying a lot of the figures in the in the traditional Labour right seats, particularly I guess around Sydney, have felt the need to become more progressive because they want to appeal to certain groups within their electorate. So if you've got the same people there, how can you make the Labour Party more right-wing inclined, which as you pointed out is the way that Labour wins elections if the people you've got there are moving to what are termed progressive positions? Well, I think there are a few responses to that. Uh, one, uh, I'm going to audaciously say that uh, the Labour MPs don't necessarily always get it right. Mm. You know, their perception of what their electorate looks like these days might, be, might, might, might not be entirely accurate. Uh, the second point uh, I'd make is that we don't need progressives in inner city seats to be sitting on 13% margins. And while we can't win a seat in central Queensland. So to put it more bluntly, you know, I'd love to take you know, 5 or 6% off. Uh, I'll say someone like Jed Carney, who sits on about 13% uh, in her electorate, and put it on our candidate and Flynn, which would be sufficient to get him or her across the line. Uh, the, the last point I'd make is that the Labor Party has to stop giving up on regional seats. Now, I'm sure there were many people... I remember saying to Bill Shorten about maybe a week out from polling day, I was in Rockhampton, and I was really quite distressed because I could feel the mood in Rockhampton wasn't good. Um, and you know, I, I made, I think, an appropriate assumption that that would be the same in Gladstone and, and elsewhere. And I said to Bill, I said, look, you might think that you can win this election without these regional Queensland seats, and if you can, we'll put on you. But if you can't, you're going to lose this election. But most importantly, you'll have a better caucus if these people are in it. Uh, in other words, people are thumping the table who live in regional Queensland, who understand regional Queensland, and can help to draw the party back to the sensible centre. So I suppose what I'm saying is that we can't give up on them. I'm not saying Bill had given up on them, by the way, that's for him to say or not to say, but if we give up on them, we'll just be increasingly a caucus of progressives uh, and we can't win the election if that's the case. So you were saying out of the Queen Bee research and you were saying that this has application in Western Sydney and the Hunter and Central Queensland, uh, that the voters, your traditional Labor voters you'd lost, you end up saying here in this Q&A period that they began to hate you. Now, as you know, once people begin to hate you, it's very hard to get them back. If you look at when the Labour Party, as you know, did not split in the 1950s in New South Wales, it did in Victoria and Queensland, and people like my father who'd been in it for years, when they were suddenly expelled, they ended up hating the Labour Party, they never came back. So if, if people who were, who, who, who were set upon and regarded as not wanted how do you get them back? Well, you have to move quickly, well, I guess. Yeah. You have to move quickly and loudly. You know, you, you won't get them back by saying we're not against gas or we're not against coal. You know, that's just too nuanced. Uh, I've been, unfortunately, framed uh, by my enemies and by some of the media since the last election as you know, a person who just has a focus on coal or fossil fuels. Uh, that is unfortunate for me, but it's something I've been prepared to wear um, because the, I need to put a, what you might call an amber claim in. You know, I need to be um, more right wing, if you like, than is necessary to get you know, to, to, to get back to the centre. Um, and we have to just hope 
the, the person, the, those who have deserved us, of those who have deserved us, the people who just hate us are only a, a minority, but they still hope we can get the balance of them back. But we won't get them back until we're very loud and clear about our intentions and, and until they believe we are genuinely backing them. And again, nuanced language and a failure uh, of uh, senior people in the party to visit coal mines and the like, uh, you know, that won't get us there. Well, as you know, they they feel that you've left them. Like my father was a great admirer of Chifley and Curtin felt the Labour, Ebbett Labour Party left mm -hmm. him out mm -hmm. in the 50s. He was one of tens of thousands. But they feel that you've, you've you've left them out. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, of course. Uh, and they are, they are also a demographic susceptible to, you know, uh, the right-wing media. Um, Sky, you know, Sky did that deal with Wind Television maybe more than a year ago now, which allows their programs to go into regional Australia free to air. Uh, and uh, I, I just find it, I'm flabbergasted by the number of people uh, in the regions listening to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and the message that hurts us most is the, the, sentence, the suggestion that we're you know, in bed with, with the Greens. So I did, a, I did an interview with Rowan Dean, uh, sadly in the middle of the bushfires, which might have been the, might have been the best timing, but um, I had a very, I, I agreed to go on there one Sunday morning if he gave me a sensible interview and he did to his credit, it was a good conversation, uh, I thought. And I have never had in my local area, because it was December and I was home, so many people react to an interview I did. I said, oh, you watch, I go to the, 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 the bread shop. Oh, you, good interview. Oh, you watch that. Oh, me and my husband never miss it, you know, outsiders. And I'm going to the supermarket and three people would say, oh, good interview, I'm rolling too. And I went to the, I went to a function where uh, I met up with a liberal, a, a liberal councillor uh, on the Cessnock City Council. He'd be well into his 70s, I hope I ever just misrepresented him. Um, and he said, Oh, good interview on Rowan Dean. <laughs> By then, I sort of had it up. I said, Oh, you watch that show regularly, do you? Uh, and he lives in a sort of an upmarket retirement village nearby. And he said, Understand this, Joel. He said, In my village, everyone's on channel 53, which is the, yeah. the number of uh, you, you know, well, I've noticed you go to. Well, I've noticed that too in southern New South Wales, where we spend a bit of time. That a lot of people come up to you in places you don't expect, like Woolworths, and yeah. say, oh, I saw you on the Bolt Report yeah. or something. And, and I, I was surprised by that, because they're, they're obviously watching this this wind, this free to air uh, channels, most of the time. Some have Fox all, but... It's why I go on it so often. People yeah. say, why are you on Sky so often? Because I'm talking about our people. Um, and that's what we need to be doing. But I actually, it, it's so entrenched now, I pick it up in people's language. So some character will bail me up in the pub, and he'll say something which I know came straight off Sky News, because I heard it myself, you know, for example, I say, you've got to stop watching Sky News, but he's have a bit of a laugh about that, but it's just, it's very, very influential, and we need to be in these spaces talking their language. There is a reluctance of some of you people to go on Sky, yeah. that's changed a bit, I see Tony Plebisex going on a bit now. She's a regular with Alan Jones, Alan Jones. Yeah, full, full credit to him. Yes, that's good, that's good, but, so, how do you, how do you get this message through, because, I would recognise, you would recognise that in a difficult year, Anthony Albanese has done okay and it's not an okay. easy period. But for the first time, I think, certainly, I think probably ever, the first time Labor has a leader who's from the left faction and whose only chance of losing that seat would be to the Greens. And Tanya Plebisek, although she's no longer deputy leader, she's a very influential figure on the front bench. She's also got a seat which she could only lose to the Greens. Now that's got to put a constraint on your policy developments, doesn't it? I mean, what you've got is a Labor Party that's got a leadership now that's that's led by the left. Yeah, look, Jared, if you if you if you set in front of me three emerging policy contests, you would, I suspect, predict absolutely which side of the debate I would be on. Or at least what my starting point yeah. uh, might be before maybe being influenced by others in a, uh, in a public debate. Um, and that's true of all of us, and you are right. Um, a lot of people in the leadership positions now, um, 
sit in a different place than I do and have different starting points, and that makes it a challenge. Now, after the election, uh, I you know I had a long discussion with Albo, who I still consider a mate, and uh, you know I asked him to convince me that uh, from his you know from his left faction he could be sufficiently pragmatic and take us back to the centre, and uh, he assured me that, that would be the case. Uh, and he always struck me as a pragmatic guy. He has been through the toughest of periods. COVID's made it probably impossible for opposition leaders and maybe not giving him the time either to set it down, sort of make his mark you know, in some of those spaces. But uh, I have to say that, well, as I said in my speech, uh, we have a long way to go before we can claim to put Labor back into the Labor Party. You've got a background in small business. You've got a very diverse background. You've got a seat in the Hunter Valley, so you're a, a regional, rural and regional member. There are not many of you lot on the front bench. Uh, do you regret not having put your hand up for the leadership? You thought about it for a while, didn't you? Yeah, I said in my press conference on my resignation from the front bench that I regretted not contesting the leadership. Uh, I would not have won, you know, in that beauty contest, I call it, where the rank and file uh, have a vote. Uh, Albanese was always going to win because you know he had strong support. I mean, the numbers are in the cities, um, not in the regions. So I call it the, the university. That's the teams. Labor Party branch. The Labor branches. Yeah, you know, the numbers are in the city, and yes. I would not have beaten Albanese. But I, I do. I said at the press conference, but it would have been a good opportunity to, to develop what you might call a mandate, even though I'll be the loser. Um, maybe able to demonstrate the weight of support there is for the greater emphasis on the region and a greater, greater commitment to return to our blue collar base. I could have used that um, as, you know, in, in, in my arguments and in speeches like the one I provided tonight. But anyway, that's history. I didn't do it. Um, no great loss because, again, I wouldn't have won the election, but uh, would have been, I think I, I lost an opportunity to do the, the town hall meetings uh, and to put the, the other view. So when you, you mentioned in your speech today, you spoke about putting the Labour back and putting Labour back into the Labour Party. So L-A-B-O-U-R, sort of the old Labour movement back into the L-A-B-O-R, the Australian Labour Party. How do you do that these days when it's a very much a professional party? It's a very much based in the, you know, a lot of its membership bases in the inner cities. It's, uh, as you make the point, sort of moving to be progressive rather than socially conservative as the old Labour Party was. So... How do you put Labor back into the Labor Party? Well, first of all, I think it's a term that uh, quickly encapsulates where we've been. I mean, the, the reasons we were formed, you know, the shearing sheds of Queensland, the wharfs of Balmain, Labor, you know, coal mines, etc. Uh, that's what we were born to do, represent those people. Now, not all uh, people who struggle in the workforce are blue-collar workers, of course. Um, those who work in aged care centres and, and the like, uh, and even in retail, uh, have to be part of our constituency uh, too. But I go back to building the coalition. Uh, and you're right, it's a professional sort of a, it is a professional these days. Um, but we do have to start securing some, what I would describe as real candidates. We had a very good one in the electorate of Flynn in central Queensland at their last election, you know, a local footballer and councillor in local, local government, etc. Very good. Uh, presented very, very well, but we gave him no hope of winning. Um, but I make, I, I make that point to make another. Uh, we have the strictest dis party discipline in the world, not just in Australia, in my view, in the world. I'll have a look around. Uh, arguably, the Liberal Party of Australia has the second strictest discipline in the world. Um, and we're asking, we're asking candidates in the regions to deliver the same message we're delivering in the city of Melbourne or city, cities of Melbourne or Sydney. And you can't win elections like that. We have to allow our candidates and indeed city members to be champions of their own electorates. You can't be a champion of the electorate of Clint, um, talking the language of inner city Melbourne. Um, we need to give them more flexibility and more ability to, to say what they need to say to win an election. So, so what should Labor members or potential members, candidates, be saying about coal and gas? They should be saying uh, that uh, the resources sector is the economic backbone of our country. It gives us that additional level of capital wealth. 
and uh, while ever there is demand for our products, we should keep selling it. It's a very simple message, and in doing so, uh, create, you know, maintain the workforce and indeed grow the workforce, increase increase the foreign earnings, etc., uh, etc. Et but we, we can't have people saying, "Oh, we're not against the coal mine industry," or "We're not against the oil and gas industry." That doesn't cut it. I mean, the punters are awake up at that very, very quickly. Talking to some, I noticed I picked up an ABC presenter on News Breakfast and my media watchdog blog who'd recently who'd condescendingly said about the coal industry that you know we if coal was taken out of these areas if we weren't exporting it if we weren't digging it up that we would have to look after low income earners but as you know tell us i mean coal th these people earn lots of money don't they well these people just don't know what they're talking about Jared. these people i mean and my coal miners earn on average one hundred and thirty thousand dollars a year it's pretty it's pretty good income Particularly in a rural, in a regional yeah, area. Yeah. yeah. Uh, some some will be as low as 110, and, and some will be much higher. They've got a higher accreditation and skills, and they might be a deputy, for example. Some will be on 250, an engineer will be on 250. A tape qualified engineer will be on 250, no problem at all. Um, so these people aren't getting jobs elsewhere that pay anything like that sort of money. Um, certainly not working on windmills or, you know, or solar panels. Uh, and they're all locked into a mortgage. Uh, and they can't pay the mortgage on anything less than what they are on now, or they would struggle to. So this idea that we can transition them to another job is just ridiculous. But in any sense, in, in any case, why are we talking about a transition that's not happening? Yeah, our coal, coal generation sector is in transition, and we know that Bredell will close in two years, and Bayswater will close in 15 years, and but some of the younger generators in Queensland will go uh, for another 25 or more years, but they're going. And you know, no one will invest in a coal by a new coal fired generator, uh, in my view, because you need a 40 to 50 year return. And, uh, we don't know what the energy system's going to look like in a week, let alone you know, 20 years' time. So that won't happen. But the coal sector is dominated by exports. About 95% of our coal goes to export markets, not, not, not used here in Australia. And demand for our, both our metallurgical and thermal coal will remain strong for decades to come. I was meeting with a coal mining company yesterday in my country. Uh, which is just about to invest a billion dollars to keep the mine going to at least 2050. This is thermal coal. Now, I always say follow the money. You know, forget about all the reports from the think tanks. If this company is prepared to, and this is a second tier company that raises private equity, equity no, not one of the big public listed companies, global companies. If they're prepared to put a billion dollars on the line because they reckon our customers in Asia are still going to by our thermal coal, I reckon, believe them. Have a look at what Pacific National and um, Horizon are putting into their, their rail stock. They, they of course, uh, take the, the coal to port. Uh, Glencore, who mischievously just last week announced they're closing two mines, hinting that it was about their climate, you know, their carbon footprint, uh, are now extending three other mines. They'll be opening more coal than they are closing. And they are only closing those mines because they've run out of coal. They were always going to close. So the coal mining industry is going to be around for a long, long time. Says, so please stop talking about transition because there is no job. But and miners are in transition themselves. If you're a 35 year old coal miner with a wife and kids, uh, you won't be able to work there for another 30 years to raise your kids and to give them the best opportunity in life. Most coal miners don't want their kids to be coal miners. They'd much rather they become a doctor, a nurse, a, a lawyer, or a, you know, an engineer, whatever they, whatever there is there want in life. So they're in transition. They know it's not going to be there forever, but they don't want a government coming along with some policy that's going to close their job off earlier before they get that opportunity to give their kids uh, the opportunity that they want to provide for them. Well, I suppose you can understand why an ABC presenter from the inner city essentially uh doesn't understand the coal industry, but what about your own colleagues? I mean, do they understand the, the vibrancy of coal and gas in these areas of, of central, of, of the Hunter Valley, New South Wales, central Queensland? Do you think they understand those local economies? Some do, but I think they are in the minority. Uh, we had a, a recent long interaction on gas policy. Uh, it was all publicised and we had a settlement on what we'd be saying about gas. And it struck me uh, during that debate 
just how little the majority of the caucus knew about gas. Now, that's not a criticism of them. I, you know, I've always had a strong interest because I'm a regional member. I've been the shadow minister on more than one occasion, so I've had to know it well. Uh, and we all have our niche areas of interest and expertise, but you know, just simple things like they don't think about they they think when they think gas, uh, they think electricity generation, for example. The thirty seven percent or thereabouts of gas consumption uh, happens in our manufacturing plants, either as a feedstock or as a heating source. Ten percent uh, we use in our households, and you know, people don't. You say, I say to people, do you have gas hot plates at home? Yeah. So where do you think the gas comes from? No, oh, I haven't really thought about that. You know. Um, so you know, we need to do better at educating uh, city-based MPs on some of these issues: the difference between thermal and coking coal. You know, how much goes to electricity generation, how much gets exported overseas. And by the way, the folk on, on climate change, almost the entire focus is on electricity generation. And yeah, it's, it does. It is the larger part of the emissions, but cheap transport up there is big. Agriculture is big, and we rarely talk about that. Now, Bill Shorten, it was handled badly, but he he wanted to have a target of getting fifty percent of our vehicles on the road electric, electric by. I don't remember what year it was now, and it killed him. But it's pretty sensible because you need three phase for these charging stations. So you got to you got to bring forth the investment, and that was his plan. He was going to make people buy electric cars, but we do need to focus on the other sectors and take some of the bloody weight and, and focus off the electricity generation centre because it is in transition. It, that, that is happening. I watch a bit of television, as you would expect. I don't often see the Labor leadership at coal mines or gas sites. Is, the, is your leader been to coal mines recently? Well, uh, Richard Miles' deputy leader was recently at a gas project impacts in Darwin, which was very good. He also came along and spoke to the cattlemen, the cattle exporters, etc. And uh, that was, I think, an experience he appreciated. Um, but no, Albo, um, you know, in 18 months, uh, hasn't been to the coal mine. So why would that be? Because as you know, he's interested in the economy. Does he feel that that would send a bad message to his supporters in the inner city? Uh, I think so. Uh, and I think it's entirely possible that they've had not been bushfires. Uh, he might have made it, and then COVID came along, making it more difficult. But bushfires should not have made a difference. You know, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, in December last year, um, Matt Canavan, who was the minister and I was the shadow minister, uh, rang me and said the CEO of the World Coal Organisation is in the building. Well, I'd like to come and meet her. So I did. Um, and Matt and I had a photograph with her, and I posted it on Twitter. Maybe I was being a little bit mischievous, <laughs> but but I had uh, something like two thousand and ten people uh, criticise me on Twitter because I had the audacity, as the shadow minister for mining, uh, to have my photo to, or to meet with and have my phone taken with the CEO of the World Coal Organisation with the the minister. Now, what is I know, I know that's a Twitter sphere and you should dismiss it and take no notice of it. But what what's in the water, Jerry? Uh, that it's become a crime to have your photograph taken or meet with the, you know, an important stakeholder uh, in an industry which earns us tens, hundreds of billions of export earnings every year. And pays a lot of company tax. A lot. I saw those recent and, and royalties, yeah. And, and royalties and company tax, so of course, um, as well as ex export income. There's an elitism here too creeping into the Labor Party, Joe. You know, it's a, I'm, I'm an enlightened person, you're not. If you're not as focused on climate change policy, you don't understand. What was the term you used? You were as what person? It, uh, the elitism is, yeah. is it, well, if it, not as enlightened. Enlightened. Yes, yeah, you know, oh, you don't understand. Yeah. You know, the, the world's coming to an end and yes. this has to be our entire yeah. focus. And yeah. that's what you, you know, if you don't speak that language, then and you're stupid, basically. Um, you don't understand what's, ha what's happening. So you're copying that, and I understand why you're copying it on Twitter. Are you copying, are you copying that in the Labor caucus? I think there's an elitism in the caucus, yes. Yeah, in the shadow there. ministry? In the shadow cabinet, yes. In the shadow cabinet as well? Yeah. And there's uh, even a little bit of born to rule type stuff. Um, you know, frivolous criticism of our opponents. Um, like an Prime Minister? You know, yeah. So, so give us an example. What, what's frivolous about the criticism? 
Well, yeah, I remember one day uh, being in a meeting, I won't say which one, um, and a, a new minister was appointed on, on the other side. And there was a, 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 a chuckle around the room and a suggestion that, you know, that was a bit of, bit of a poor appointment um, and that the person probably, you know, wasn't up to the job was the suggestion. And I said, what are you talking about? I said, I know this person, uh, pretty capable, and I think the person will do okay. I'm, I'm being careful not to be gender specific. I noticed that. Um, <laughs> and uh, yes. I know this is, uh, th th this is the mob that beat us every election. Yeah. But we believe we are superior to them intellectually. And I think that's part of our problem. Yes, but as you know, I work for John Howard, but in opposition. And um, John Howard never underestimated his opponents. And eventually he got there. But you know, it's not the wisest thing to do. Talk about the attitude of the Prime Minister. What are they? I think they, I, I think they initially uh, underestimated Scott Morrison. Um, I think probably they're learning now that he's a formidable opponent, um, in part because he's pretty good on the marking and the spin. Um, but it's not necessarily a criticism. That's most good Prime Ministers are. Um, but, you know, I think they've come to learn to take him more seriously. Now, you, as you know, you, you had a role as Shadow Minister for Agriculture, and you mentioned agriculture a, a bit before. Um, there's a similar kind of attitude to some agricultural industries as there are to some mining resources industries mm -hmm. among the people who call themselves progressive, some of whom are in the Labor Party, yeah. most of whom are in the Greens, I suppose, but you, you notice that as well? Oh, of course. Uh, not as much because while the, the level of uh, comprehension of the industry, uh, of the resource industry is not high, uh, the agriculture is even lower. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't think there's a, a broad understanding of agriculture in, in the Labor Party. I was on a steep learning curve myself when I first became the minister for that 12 week period I describe as the golden era in agriculture. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, it, it's a complex area, but yeah, of course, there's the yeah, animal welfare issues, there's sustainability issues, land clearing, soil health, you know, the, the idea that farmers don't properly, you know, take care of their natural environment and all that sort of thing. Yeah, there's a bit of that in the Labor Party, but they don't spend much time thinking about that. So talk about the Greens. They've got what? They've managed to get one seat in the federal parliament when Lindsay Tanner resigned from politics in Melbourne. They've been suggestions they might have got other seats, but they haven't. Um, they haven't got much above 10% over the years. They've held their vote. Yeah. Um, to what extent are they a threat to the Labor Party? Well, I don't see them as a threat. They might be a threat to us in a couple of seats, um, but if we build the right coalition of support, we wouldn't necessarily need those, those seats. Uh, they're an each party, they only ever have to chase, you know, something just less than 10% of the vote and they get the outcome they're looking for. The National Party's the same, uh, by the way. Um, but they have enough critical mass to kill us uh, out there in the electorate because, you know, as a shadow minister, I would spend uh, some time almost every day dealing with another Greens motion in the Senate and having arguments with my own, own people about whether we should be supporting it or not supporting it. Now, I often say that I can go back to my electorate on the Friday after a sitting week, the most tumultuous sitting week, you know, a leadership change, for example, something very newsworthy. I'll walk into the pub Friday night and some way will inevitably say, you know, Fitzy, where have you, where have you been this week? You know, I mean, they don't even know we're down there, yeah. let alone what's going on in the bubble. But I can go to any pub in central Queensland and some character will try to tell me how many times we voted with the Greens in the Senate last year. The number is always different, but this is the strength of the LNP Bush Telegraph. You know, they're reinforcing this yes. idea all the time that we're yes. in bed with the Greens, and in the end, they're going to come after your job as a result. Now, we don't deal with that perception in the regions. Uh, we're going to continue to struggle in the regions. There should just be a rule on Senate motions. If it's from the Greens, we're against it. No matter how meritorious it might be, and then you have a standard. Someone can't argue, oh, you should have, you should have supported that one. But just say, well, their motions, they don't have any effect. No practical effect, no outcome. We should just vote against them all. It's hard to expect you to give a, a comprehensive answer on this, but it always seemed to me that the 
policy in certain parts of Australia where the Liberals give their preferences to the Greens is counterproductive for the Liberals. Now, you're a Labor man, you probably would say that, but that's the only way the Greens can threaten you most of the time if the Liberals give them their preferences over the Labor Party in seats that the Liberals cannot win. I guess that in an unusual way. I won't talk about the Liberal Party or the Labor Party. Uh, I'll talk about the need for, for like-minded people uh, to, if only very informally, stick together. Uh, now, if you're not of the moderate wing uh, of the, you know, if you're on the sort of, you know, the more right wing side of the Liberal Party or the more conservative side, uh, uh, you should be talking and working with people on the conservative side and the Labor Party about those decisions. So there'll be different outcomes for different people, I suppose, but we should be all banding together and see the Greens as a common threat. Now, it's about a bit over a year since you were here last and what was quite a, a groundbreaking address. And since then, you've stepped down from the Labor Party front bench. So another 14 months will take us up pretty close to the next election, maybe beyond it, but more likely close to the next election. What are you going to be doing in the next year and a bit? You, you'll recontest. Uh, my plan is Hunter. to recontest. Yeah, yeah, my plan is to recontest. Uh, it might be that I have to recontest. It may be that I can say modestly that I'm the only person that can hold Hunter. So I might owe to the party uh, to well, run. That's, not, it's, it's that's not that Im, that's not that immodest. I mean, that's quite possible. I mean, it went very close to the nationals last time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. It's uh, it's still on three percent. A lot of a lot of members in Canberra love have a three percent margin, but yeah. uh, you know we have to be be very careful about Hunter. But but I want to run uh, because I haven't given up on Labor winning an election. Uh, if I thought that Labor couldn't possibly win the election, I might not contest because, you know, my my pathway back to the the time available for my pathway back to the blue carpet, as we call it, the ministerial wing, is is, is shrinking. So if we didn't win next time, then I'd be waiting six years. Well, almost six years for an opportunity. Uh, I'm 58 years of age. I'm running out of time. So um, the fact that I intend to win really contest tells you that I still give Labor hope, but. We won't win if we don't change our trajectory, if we don't start building that coalition of support. And uh, if I can labour the point again, Labour, uh, we don't start putting Labour back into the Labour Party. That's a pretty good spot to finish on. Many thanks, Charles, for giving. Merry Christmas. Same to you.